Welcome back to Rideau High and my review of that tour de force of literature, the Grease 2 novelization. Yes, I'm really doing this. This was released in 1982 and is written by William Rotzler from a screenplay by Ken Finkelman. Rotzler had, shall we say, a colourful career. He has four Hugo Awards to his name, but for best fan artists, a booby prize of sorts. It says people like you, but you aren't getting paid either way. He was also a jobbing actor and wrote a handful of novels for Star Trek and Marvel. Finkelman's career was rather more conventional writing and directing for TV, though prior to and post-1982, you'd be hard-pressed to find something that would suggest he'd be a good fit for Grease 2. From these two luminaries, we get a movie as well regarded as Grease 2 and this novelization. The usual plot stuff is about to follow, and the slider below will help you skip it to the meat and bones of the re review, but don't consider any part of this video spoiler free. Surely though, you know this story already. Set in 1961, Grease 2 begins with a new school year. All the major players from the first one have graduated and gone, presumably to a big automobile accident in the sky. One of the few returnees is Frenchie, whose cousin Michael, an Englishman, has joined the school. Michael is, being English, obviously super smart and handsome. We all are. It's just a fact. Michael takes an interest in Stephanie Zanoni, but she is a pink lady, and pink ladies are only allowed to date T-birds leader of the T-Bird gang in this novel is Johnny, and Stephanie has recently broken up with him. He isn't taking that too well or laying down. Despite her aversion to being told that she can only date leather-clad bikers, Stephanie tells Michael that she is only interested in dating leather-clad bikers. Naturally, he decides to buy a motorbike, funding this by writing assignments for the various T-Birds. At the bowling alley, a rival gang is making trouble, and Michael, covering his face, saves the T-Birds from a beating. They are far from grateful for this intervention when they see that Stephanie is rather taken with the mystery to her rider. Michael, still hiding his face, meets up again with Stephanie at the garage where she works. The T-Birds again intervene, chasing him on their motorbikes until he rides over a cliff and is presumed dead. At the later talent show, Stephanie interrupts the Pink Lady's song to dream about her man, somehow interpreted as the winning song. She's declared Queen of the Luau and Johnny the King, but then the Luau is crashed, literally, by the rival biker gang until Zombie Michael chases them into a swimming pool and reveals himself to Stephanie. Michael is then allowed to join the T-Birds, but as they're graduating anyway, you rather hope they'll be leaving all this nonsense behind and getting a job, which sounds like a great idea for Grease 3. Let me write it down. I haven't got a pen. I'm sure I'll remember. Now that story might sound kind of trashy. It's probably worse in its actual execution, but there is still a universal appeal to a story where a boy meets a girl and sets about bettering himself in order to win her heart. Now you can argue that by wasting valuable school time screwing around on a motorbike and joining a gang, Michael may not actually be doing something that counts as bettering himself. But when was the last time you saw a movie with the basic premise of boy meets girl? I think the world needs more stories like that, and even in more progressive times, Stephanie hardly qualifies as a damsel. Michael saves the T-Birds and the school, but she's not in any real danger herself, unless you count from Johnny's unhealthy obsession. And she also has a distinctly masculine job, fixing cars as well. That Michael retains his book smarts and adds a bit of masculinity along the way makes this seem like it might play well on both sides of the current political divide. That's not to say that the universality of its basic premise can gloss over the aspects of the story that haven't aged well. This is a rather horny bunch of teens, all played by 20-somethings on screen, of course, and the boys are all aggressively sexual, leading rather too many girls to have to squirm away or out from underneath them. And that would definitely not play well in the current era, which is a shame because the girls, especially Paulette, who is devoted to Johnny but the most overtly mistreated for that devotion, well... All the girls seem to come out on top in the end. That Dolores is far too young for such things, and Mr. Stewart, who prays a little prayer for the pink ladies to be in his sex education class, and is later rebuked for some unspecified misdemeanor with a student body, well, all of that is played for last because universality only goes so far, and apparently 1982 Holly Weird was more honest with itself. 
in another world, this story might actually play out as commentary on the dangers of peer pressure, gangs and bullying, but perhaps the producers felt that that wouldn't sit right with Demucci trying to trick his girlfriend into sleeping him unsuccessfully by convincing her that World War III had started, or one student telling the principal she had missed her last two periods, only to be told she can make them up after school. One of the more interesting things about a novelization like this, something we were discussing on uh, paper movies a week or two back, was how you integrate the music into the story. Generally, Rotzler goes for the approach of integrating a few lines from the song as dialogue, which is far more effective in some places than in others. Cool Rider is done about as well as can be expected. If you really want to know what I want in a guy, she said, well, I'm looking for a dream on a mean machine with Helena's eyes. She stopped and turned away abruptly. Cool rider, she almost whispered. If he's cool enough, he can burn me through and through. She seemed to be talking to herself and embarrassed Michael. If it takes forever, then I'll wait forever. No ordinary boy is going to do, she said, giving him a swift up and down look. While the jumble of voices that recount the film's first number, Back to School, works quite well as snippets of conversation heard as the students file in Stephanie's dream sequence during the talent show, which is particularly awful, and it is in the film as well. The closing number at the luau is horribly contrived, but then the last 20 minutes of the film are over in five pages here. Clearly, Rotzler had another porno to shoot by that point. He was beyond caring, I think, which is why this happened. The T-Birds can hear, but are not noticed by the two they are watching. A very strange piece of prose, I'm sure you'll agree, particularly as it's the only sentence in the book written in the present tense. But that's because it's a piece of the screenplay that Rotzler has copied word for word rather than rewrite. I'm not sure if it's a shame or just rather fitting that Rotzler clearly gave up, but I doubt he's ever been accused of overstaying his welcome, because Grease 2 is easily reasonable in a single sitting, and despite that, dare I say, it's fabulous. And look at this, from the very first page, a genuine metaphor, a simile, adjectives. The roar came from every direction, from up and down the street. It was the deep-throated, proud thunder of arriving students. The ear-splitting noise came like a surf, irresistible and powerful, charging straight at them. And have a look at this description of the motorbikes. The charging beasts of steel and rubber, gasoline-breathing dragons with their rusty nights astride, thundered through the nights. I know I've been on a bit of a dry spell lately, but of the last half dozen books I've reviewed on this channel, this is actually some of the better writing I've seen, which is kind of embarrassing for the writers of those other novels, but Rotzler deserves a little bit of credit too. Some of the issues with the book, like Mr. Stewart being an outright pervert, were toned down for the film quite wisely. And in the novel, Michael is at the talent show rather than having his return held back until he saves the luau. Johnny doesn't accidentally swallow the cigarette, he just spits it out and the end of the scene is much weaker than in the film. He ran off around the corner towards the water fountain. Goose looked at the soggy cigarette with a wisp of smoke coming up from it and shuddered. So there were one or two little aspects there that during the course of Rotzler being given a screenplay to work with and the final edit of the film being released that were actually improved a little. But the, there are also one or two scenes in the book that don't make it into the film that add a little something to the characters as well. So it's actually a little bit rewarding if you're a fan of the film to read the book and vice versa. In conclusion, Grease 2 is readable in a single sitting. It races through its silly set pieces, shoehorns in its musical numbers, and just about manages to make Surly Stephanie and Wide-Eyed Michael's relationship seem like it might even be a good idea. As a source of member berries for fans of the film, it's a delight and the universal appeal of its theme, a smattering of prose that's of a higher quality than you'd expect, they all help. Stephanie is probably more likeable if you remember that she looks like this than in the version in the book, but wanting more than she has is perfectly relatable, even if the specifics of what she wants is kind of stupid. It's about as far from politically correct a book as you'll find in the current era, it's overtly sexual, pokes fun and mental illness, and it tries to find humour in bullying. As such, it's an absolute breath of fresh air that I wholeheartedly recommend so to, to fans of the film while wondering what anyone else is going to get from it. Obviously, it might surprise you, but probably not. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then liking and subscribing is the way to get more of this sort of thing.